The open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. In addition, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded by Zephora Films. The first item is uh, request authorization for the approval of the minutes of October 11, 2018. A motion's in order? So moved. Second. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item number two, request authorization to submit an application for the Economic Development Agency grant for the United States Department of Commerce in support of 12 Channel Street Mass Robotics Project and to take all related actions. Dana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Secretary Polhemus. This action before you is a, a matter in somewhat simple terms of housekeeping. The request for an application to the EDA was brought to the board in October uh, in support of a an application of approximately $2 million to support mass robotics expansion within the Marine Industrial Park. Uh, that action was taken through the Boston Planning and Development Agency Board. That being said, given that this project exists within the Marine Industrial Park, it is more appropriate that it uh, be under the auspices of the EDIC. Hence, this action is to move that to this portion of the, uh, the agenda and under these auspices. I'm more than happy to uh, review elements of the application and the, and the scope, but that is the, the gist of the request. Okay, thank you, Dana. <coughs> Are there any questions from the board? Um, what is the timeline of the grant and the project itself? The Mass Robotics exists within the, the park already, and they're looking to expand to double their size. The, the grant review process actually will be starting in the, at the end of November. Uh, the EDA has already provided a preview uh, of the general scope and has given its blessing, so to speak, for a submission of the application. And it's a, it's a rolling review process. There's no deadline per se, but the preliminary materials have been submitted and have been granted, uh, as mentioned, a pr preliminary review. The anticipated deadline or the anticipated uh, grant award is likely early next year, uh, first quarter of 2019. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, there's no further questions and a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Ayes have it. Item Thank number you. three, personnel. Jeanette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. We have one appointment for your consideration with all details in the board memo. Lauren Firmstein, Property Specialist, Leasing Management and Operations in the Real Estate Division, Industrial Development Department with a start date of December 10th. We have one Employment Service Contractor Agreement for your consideration with details listed in the board memo. Joe Christo from the Planning Division. We have two travel items for your consideration with details listed in the board memos. Sarah Meyerson, Director of Planning, and Victoria Phillips, Planning Assistant, both from the Planning Division. We have two departures with details listed in the board memos. Eric Hokinson, Waterfront Planner 2, from the Planning Division, and Sharon Pachetti, Custodian 2, from the Real Estate Division. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeanette. Are there any questions? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item number four, we need a motion to adjourn the EDIC meeting. I move we adjourn the EDIC meeting. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. All right. <clears throat> The open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. In addition, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded by Zephora Films. The first item on the agenda is request authorization for the approval of the minutes of October 11th, 2018. <coughs> Motions in order? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Item number two, 
request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 13, 2018 at 5.30 p.m. are at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the development plan for plan development area number 118, Rio Grande, Dudley Square Development, 2343 to 2345 Washington Street and 11 to 29 Roxbury Street in Roxbury. Dana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, merely a request for a scheduling of the hearing to consider Article 80 and PDA okay. as appropriate. Are there any questions? I yeah. So motions in order? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. I'm nervous because the four of film is here tonight. <laughs> Could be discovered. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Item number three, Board of Appeal. Are there any changes, Brian, or any additions? Uh, yes, we've uh, submitted for your um, authorization 46 uh, recommendations okay. uh, covering uh, ZBA hearings for November 27th and uh, December 11th. Okay, are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, the motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to hold off on item number four and come back to that. I'm going to go to item number five. Request authorization to disperse $700,000 to the Boston Parks and Recreation Department to incorporate resiliency design and engineering components into the construction of Martins Park and to address sea level rise and coastal flooding protection and to be part of a district scale flood defense mechanism for the South Boston Waterfront and Fort Point neighborhood. Chris. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Executive Secretary Paul Hemus. In August 2017, the Boston Parks and Recreation Department broke ground on the construction of Martins Park, a new universally accessible park honoring the life of Martin Richard. The park, which is located along the Four Point Channel and adjacent to the Boston Children's Museum, is now scheduled to be completed in the spring of 2019. Uh, the initial design of Martins Park developed in 2016 and 2017 incorporated coastal flood resiliency measures with elevated site grades, saltwater tolerant plantings, and anchoring to reinforce system designs to withstand periodic seawater, uh, seawater saturation. The design rendering is up on the screen before you. Uh, the recent Climate Ready Boston Coastal Resilience Solutions for South Boston report issued in October of this year has provided more specific information on future flood elevations and vulnerable areas of South Boston. The report outlines early action strategies and long-term vision for district scale shoreline protection measures that integrate open space, enhanced harbor walk along the Fort Point Channel to protect against current and future flooding events. Uh, during the development of this report, we realized that the Fort Point waterfront is particularly vulnerable to losses resulting from coastal flooding. And if no action is taken, the flood pathways from the South Boston neighborhood are expected to extend as sea levels rise into other parts of the city, including the South End. Uh, it was determined that the eastern edge of the Four Point Channel, including Martins Park parcel, is part of an early flood path that will play an important role in district scale flood protection. Uh, to address these vulnerabilities while the park is still under construction, the BPDA granted uh, the Boston Parks and Recreation Department a $40,000 grant uh, this past May to assess the initial park design and propose improvements to respond to the projected uh, climate ready uh, South Boston flood elevations uh, through design modifications that further advance both site resiliency and neighborhood protection. Uh, the Parks Department's consultant has now developed design updates to topography, topography to minimize flood pathways, uh, also armoring portions of the park that we anticipate may receive greater storm inundation, and assessments of the detailing around the existing seawall to allow for future modifications if a seawall retrofit becomes part of a broader uh, resiliency solution for this area. Uh, the requested funding will now allow for the integration of these resiliency measures into the design so that the park provides protection as well as still feeling opening and welcoming uh, to the, uh, the public. The park design will also serve as a model for how we approach uh, district scale resiliency measures uh, elsewhere in the city. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board? How will this uh connect with the resiliency efforts that are being made by the private developers along the Fort Point Channel um, and also the uh, federal courthouse? Yes. Uh, I mean, right now, a lot of focused efforts are on the Gillette properties as well. So there's a, a 
the FEMA pre-disaster mitigation grant that we've submitted for, also working with the Gillette Company, so that's covering another portion of the South Boston waterfront. Um, we've got these other efforts, you know, with the Children's Museum, which is the next agenda item, and this that, that's also moving forward. And over time, we're going to be having broader discussions with the private development entities uh, along South Boston. A lot of the focused effort is, is really on these early action, low elevation points. So there's another area along uh, Seaport Boulevard, which is currently Massport property. So we'll be working with them as well to address that area. But there's obviously a lot more in the way of conversations that need to be happening with uh, private development uh, along uh, both East Boston, Charlestown, and South Boston to deal with these, these flood pathways. If there's no further questions, then a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. I'm going to go back to item number four. Okay. Request authorization to petition the Zoning Commission to amend Article, 80, Article 53, East Boston Neighborhood District, with respect to the plan development area, dimensional regulations, and the Suffolk Downs Economic Development Area. Tim. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Burke, members of the board, uh, Secretary Polemus. Suffolk Downs is a 160-acre site that spans the Boston Revere border. Um, 109 acres of that site are in East Boston. Uh, a development proposal for the site is currently being reviewed under Article 80. In order to allow for consideration of proposed planned development areas that further the planning objectives uh, for East Boston, a zoning amendment is proposed that modifies the maximum allowable height and FAR for proposed PDAs in the Suffolk Downs Economic Development Area Subdistrict. Uh, currently within the Suffolk Downs EDA, there is a maximum height within 250 feet of a street or zoning subdistrict um, of 55 feet. It is proposed that the maximum building height within the portion um, excuse me, within the portion, oh, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I get to the uh, diagram here, sorry. Um, it's proposed that the maximum building height within the portion of the Suffolk Downs EDA that is within 125 feet of the southern boundary of the Suffolk Downs EDA shall be as follows. In the portion of the special restricted height area that is more than 1,250 feet from the western boundary of the Suffolk Downs EDA, which boundary, for avoidance of doubt, is the center line of McClellan Highway, building height shall not exceed 40 feet. And in the portion of the special restricted height area that is within 1,250 feet from the western boundary of the Suffolk Downs EDA, <coughs> building height shall not exceed 85 feet. So, so just to be clear, this orange section over here um, is the 40 feet section. This red section is the 85 feet section, this being McClellan Highway over here. Maximum building height within the Suffolk Downs EDA and outside the special restricted height area shall not exceed 220 feet or FAA height limits, which, whichever is lower. FAA height limits shall mean that each proposed project within a PDA shall be consistent with the height limits set forth in the Massport Boston Logan International Airport Composite of Critical Airspace Services Map, version 2.0 which is this map right here, um, <coughs> uh, dated December 2011. Any proposed project issued a determinations of no hazard to air navigation or similar determination by the Federal Aviation Administration shall be deemed consistent with such limitations, although such a determination shall not be a zoning requirement. Um, there is, as I mentioned, an Article 80 project under review here um, being proposed by HYM Investments. Um, this is a project that's been through uh, more than a year of, of review out in the neighborhood. Um, it's currently being reviewed um, uh, DPIR. Um, the height is an issue um, that we've been discussing, and I think um, here is a sort of detailed plan of, of heights um, along that edge that have been uh, done and, and negotiated and, and figured out through a lot of community process with the neighborhood and with BPDA staff. Um, I'd like to take an opportunity to, uh, to ask uh, Councillor Edwards and Tom O'Brien from HYM Investments to discuss a little bit of that process and uh, uh, some of the other issues that we've been discussing. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Lydia Edwards. I'm the City Council for East Boston, Charleston, and the North End. I had some brief remarks. I initially had come here to oppose the amendment, but after uh, a great deal of conversation, I realized that we're actually on the same page, or ultimately we'll get there. Um, the reason why I was particularly concerned about this amendment is because when I see 
zoning amendments without, uh, I see that as a point of negotiation where the city should be advocating at its very most for the, for the neighborhood. And these zoning amendments included height, included frontage space, but also the FAR, which we have seen the city use that as a density bonus in other, other neighborhoods. So we thought in terms of this neighborhood and this new neighborhood that we are creating and to assure that we are robust in our diversity, that we would also consider this a density bonus and also negotiate to assure that the developer and the city are committed to making sure that this development complies with the FHA's Affirmative uh, Fair Housing Act. That act assures that we have integrated housing and this administration, the presidential administration, has already stated that they will not be committed to enforcing that. Further added to the fact that this is not funded by federal dollars, but luckily our city has committed at the DND level and at the BHA level that they will continue to meet those standards. And so I wanted to make sure that when it comes to the newest neighborhood in Boston that we also had a commitment in the zoning to assure that we will meet those standards for an integrated neighborhood, that the marketing for that neighborhood would also be without bias, to assure that we comply with all housing and um, anti-discrimination laws in the state and federal level, regardless of what the federal government do, and despite the fact that no federal dollars are here. To me, this is a negotiation point. Luckily, speaking with the developer, and, speak, and we submitted language to them to review that involved an MOU to talk about how you would get to assuring that this is an integrated neighborhood, to assure that we have marketing plans, all of those things we submitted to them as amendment to this, um, or as added language to this amendment. And I believe I have that commitment from them, and they will testify to that, and the commitment from the city to make sure that maybe this is not the point to add that language, but at the PDA level, when we go ultimately to have the PDA for the entire site, that that language and that commitment will be firmly uh, cemented. And so, therefore, I will withdraw any opposition at this point. I hope that this goes forward so that when we go to do get to the PDA, that that language is in there. And if it's not, I will oppose the PDA. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if I could, my name is Tom O'Brien, and thank you very much for giving me an opportunity, uh, Chairman Burke, um, Executive Director Polhemus, and members of the board. Uh, so, uh, again, my name is Tom O'Brien. I'm with the HYM Investment Group, and I just wanted to follow up on uh, the Councillor's testimony. Uh, for us as an organization, we did uh, receive information this afternoon, language from, um, uh, from Councillor Edwards uh, and her team, and we are absolutely more than happy to uh, stand by and live up to all of the requirements um, of the federal fair housing standards and federal fair housing guidelines. It's, it's a hallmark of who we are as a company, and it's certainly been a hallmark of, of the career that I've tried to lead. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us, as Tim said, in this neighborhood to create something that is um, uh, an amazing place that will add 10,000 units of housing to, um, to our, our city, uh, and we want it to be a place that is open and available to everybody across the board. So uh, we're more than happy to agree to this. The language that Councilor Edwards uh, submitted to us this afternoon is is certainly acceptable to us, and we'll make sure that that's part of the PDA as we go forward. Thank okay, you. Great. Thank you. Tim, does that conclude the presentation? Okay. Are there any questions from the board? I just want to say thank you to the councilor for coming and appearing here today. I, I think it's, I've been on the board for three years. I think it's maybe the first time um, that I've seen you, and it's really great to have you here, and I really appreciate your advocacy on behalf of fairness and development in Boston. If there's no further questions, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> Item number six, request authoriza authorization to disperse $50,000 to the Boston Children's Museum to design an integrated harbor walk and flood design mechanism to address sea level rise and coastal flooding in integrated mountain parks flood protection design as a part of a district scale flood protection plan. Chris. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Director Golden, Executive Secretary Paul Hemus. Uh, the Climate Ready Boston Coastal Resilience Solutions for South Boston, which is, which is just issued in October, proposes cohesive and integrated district scale shoreline protection measures around much of South Boston to limit current and future inundation from storm surge and sea level rise. As noted previously, uh, the report determined that the eastern edge of the Four Point Channel, which includes Martins Park, as well as the Boston Children's Museum parcels, is very vulnerable to flooding with shoreline areas currently overtopped uh, during coastal storms. Uh, the area also serves as more extensive flood pathways 
Further into South Boston, as soon as 2030, when we anticipate approximately nine inches of sea level rise. Uh, the report provides design renderings of options to protect areas of the neighborhood. The image you see on the screen is from the study of the waterside area of the museum site. and represents the types of shoreline enhancements that are anticipated, which function uh, not only to limit flood inundation, but also improve public realm, public access, and shoreline habitat. Uh, the report recommends flood protection measures to elevate shoreside areas in and around the Children's Museum by about four feet uh, to address the target elevation uh, of about 40 inches of sea level rise, which we anticipate uh, by 2070. The grant will assist the Children's Museum in developing a design that protects to that elevation and explore longer term measures framed in the report that may include expanding the waterfront with a living shoreline and salt marsh and improve access to the water's edge as part of their uh, learning programs. The design process will also ensure integration of these measures with the adjacent Martins Park and broader district scale systems that are anticipated. Are you going to ask any questions, please? Okay, thank you, Chris. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. you. Item number seven, request authorization to advertise and issue a request of, for interest concerning the redevelopment of the City of Boston owned land known as Frontage Road, 200 Frontage Road, and 400 Frontage Road, and to authorize the director to enter into any and all documented and agreements deemed appropriate and necessary regarding the request for interest. So now. Good afternoon, Chairman Bark, members of the board. Madam Secretary, Director Golden, many of you know this site as the site um, at which you go to to collect your car when it's been towed. Uh, so this is a site well known by a lot of folks in the city who <laughs> have had to endure that. Um, however, this 18-acre site is also home to a large portion of the City of Boston's municipal operations for the public works and transportation departments, as well as satellite facilities for other city agencies, including street lighting, the Senior Shuttle, the Elections Commission, and the Police Department. With the goal of delivering the highest quality services to our constituents, the city contracted with Util, a consulting company, earlier this year to explore alternatives to increase operational efficiencies and optimize city services that could, that could include the possible relocation of some of these services. The Frontage Road campus sits within the larger New Market by that circle area, which through the city's Imagine Boston 2030 plan has been identified as a, as a location for expanded growth. Benefits of redevelopment here include climate-ready infrastructure and development along West 4th Street, that's north of the site, that would repair a hole in the urban fabric and link the surrounding South End and South Boston neighborhoods. With this in mind, we are requesting authorization today to advertise and issue an RFI, a request for interest, in order to cast a wide net for development options in this site. Okay, thank you, Sunil. Are there any questions from the board? What is the, the duration of the RFI period mm -hmm. and how are you going to um, kind of solicit interest? Mm -hmm. um, so we're taking the guidance from the city on this. As I mentioned, the study with UTL is still underway. And as soon as we are given the kind of green light from the city to move forward with this, we will move forward. Um, and we'll be casting a really wide net, hoping that we get as many options as possible for development opportunities here. How will this site be connected to the city's resilience planning? Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking that question. Um, this site, um, you know, is in the floodplain, and so we're, as you know, we're looking at, um, you know, many strategies for resiliency and climate-ready infrastructure, and we're hoping that this could be a model for climate-ready infrastructure solutions that we have, uh, uh, you know, implemented in other parts of the city as well. Okay, if there's no further questions, then a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Sunil. <coughs> Item number eight, request authorization to extend the tentative designation of East Boston Community Development Corporation as the developer for the lease and development of 148 through 172 Condor Street in East Boston. Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In October of 2016, the board awarded tentative designation status to the East Boston Community Development Corporation for the development of the seven acre parcel 146 Condor Street in East Boston. Uh, their intent is to develop a maritime industrial center um, consistent with the goals of the RFP uh, port regulations in the city of Boston zoning. Those collective regulations uh, require that the site be developed for maritime uh, industrial uses only 
which would preclude any type of residential or sports fields or playgrounds or uh, anything of the like. Um, tentative designation was extended in April um, and October of 2017, and again in January, May, and August of 2018. Um, at the August board meeting, uh, the board expressed some understandable reservations about extending the tentative designation without a showing of uh, de demonstrated progress. Um, since then, BPDA staff have met uh, several times with East Boston CDC uh, to strategize on methodical uh, deliverables. Um, we've also procured the promised uh, uh, market appraisal of the site. Uh, we're here today to request an additional extension of the tentative designation through March 31st of 2019. If granted the extension, BPDA staff and East Boston CDC are committing to the following deliverables uh, before the expiration of the extension. A vote from the East Boston CDC board to guarantee equity participation, um, negotiation of the terms and conditions of a lease between BPDA and uh, East Boston CDC. Um, the CDC will procure and deliver engineering plans required to elevate the site roadway above the floodplain. Um, they will procure the necessary permits to do that um, elevation. They will also procure and deliver engineering <coughs> plans to replace the decaying seawall. Um, the cost of those deliverables um, would be somewhere between seventy and hundred thousand dollars is what is projected. That would be at the sole expense of the East Boston CDC. Um, and of course, they will remain responsible throughout the winter for the removal of uh, appropriate snow, any snow that uh, needs to be moved. That concludes the prepared comments. Um, I have, there's no formal presentation forthcoming. However, I asked Al Cotterelli and Sal Colombo from the East Boston CDC, as well as Ken Fields from Fort Point Associates to attend in the event that the board had any questions that would be more appropriate for the developers to answer. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Are there any questions from the board? I have a couple of questions. I'm glad you're taking these steps to move forward, but uh, do you have the funding in place, that $700,000, to do these items? I'm sorry. Question. Do you have the funding for the $700,000? Um, I mean, it's these steps that you're taking around planning and uh, negotiating and uh, preparing a seawall and those things, things, do you have that funding in place, or do you have to go obtain that funding no, we somewhere? we have the funding in place. You do? The oh, board's good. already approved. Uh, the commitment of a million dollars on this site. The site needs a fair amount of uh, development and we're committed to uh, doing Good. it. That's great, okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, we, they, um, the CDC had submitted their last <coughs> audited financial statement for our, uh, last financial statement for us to, to look at and there is uh, sufficient unencumbered cash. Okay, great. Well, this is some real positive steps since the last time you were here and we're glad to hear that. And we heard you loud progress. and clear last time, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you. Thank you. If there's no further questions from the board, a motion's in order? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number nine, requests authorization to extend a tentative designation of Madison T Tropical LLC as the redeveloper of Parcel 10 in the Southwest Corridor Development Plan in Roxbury. Dana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, Director Golden and Secretary Paul Hemus, we are requesting the extension of the tentative designation of Madison Tropical uh, LLC, primarily due to the progress that the team has made, not only with regard to the design for the proposed project, but namely phase three on 2085 uh, Washington Street, but also because of the work that they have been doing to secure a primary tenant on th that portion of the project, which will be the basis of a lot of their financing. They are very, very close with that work, and the additional amount of time will enable, enable, enable them to finish th all of the documentation and come back with hopefully final designation by the end of the, okay. the time. Okay, thank you, Dana. Are there any questions on the board? What does very, very close mean? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, the working out the final details of the lease arrangement between Madden, Madison LLC and that entity. Near, near signing, so thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you, Dana. Item number 10, request authorization to extend the tentative designation of P3 Partners, LLC, as the redeveloper of a portion of parcel P-3 and a portion of parcel P-3 
H in the Campus High School Urban Renewal Area. Dana. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. This extension is also in keeping with the uh, previous request uh, as was proposed last, the last time that I was before you, mainly in regard to the uh, approvals that are needed to be put in place to confirm the site plan. And currently the Boston Water and Sewer Commission is completing its review uh, that's proposed for the uh, relocation of the sewer line and related utilities that will support this project. That approval is imminent, is set to happen within the next week or two, and hence this proposed designation extension is uh, aligned to see that to completion. Okay, thank you, Dan. Any questions from the board? The, 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 this this project goes back to 2005. Yes. And we've granted a great many extensions. And I think that everyone on this board has expressed support for this project um, and concern that as interest rates increase, uh, the project may become, uh, has become increasingly uh, difficult to finance. Um, what assurance can you give us that this is the last extension that we need? I greatly appreciate that question, and I'd be remiss if I were to say there is an assurance that this will be the last extension, but I will articulate that the concern that is expressed by this board is also a concern that has been expressed uh, by the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee uh, for a sense of urgency on the part of the development team and yes, on the part of uh, this agency and our staff and team to uh, work and push for the completion of the necessary items that have been ta placed before the development team. The uh, sense of urgency that was expressed by the Oversight Committee, at it, even at its most recent meeting of uh, a week ago or two, uh, was heard loud and clear by both the development team and by staff. And so. I wouldn't want to mismanage expectations by articulating a guarantee, but I will uh, say that there is a desire to see this move as appropriate and to take necessary action accordingly. Well, I won't try to speak for the other members of the board, but um, uh, I, I have to say that it's time for that sense of urgency to be resolved. Understood. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's no further questions on a motion as an order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank, thank you very much. <coughs> Item number 11, request authorization to award final designation of Catalyst Ventures Solidary Enterprises LLC as the redeveloper of parcel L-43B located at 41 Regent Street in the Washington Park Urban Renewal Area for 14 homeowner residential units, including two IDP units, and to enter into land disposition agreement. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. The project before you is parcel L-43B in the Washington Park Urban Renewal Area, a combined lot consist consisting of 41 Regent Street, which is made up of about 3,224 square feet, and 64 Alpine Street, which is made up of about 5,700 in three square feet for a total of 8,927 square feet. I have some good news to report on this project. You may remember that this project came before you for three tentative designations, uh, extensions at the, at the March, June, and September 2018 board meetings for 90 days each time. I am happy to say that the development team is about to receive their BPDA urban design approval and has also received a commitment of construction financing from Eastern Bank. Therefore, they are ready to proceed toward final designation, and we are seeking your vote to grant this final designation. Under their access agreement with the BPDA, the developer is currently engaged in preliminary site work to prepare for the commencement of construction once the developer obtains a building permit. This preliminary site work has been undertaken in anticipation of the award of the final designation and the upcoming closing on the purchase of the property with the BPDA. 
Lastly, the project will include 14 residential condominium units, two of which will be IDP units. And I just want to draw your attention real quick to one slide of this site in the, in the map. And we will be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Are there any questions on the board? Hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Congratulations. Item number 12, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion to Wentworth Institute of Technology multi-purpose academic building located at 555 Parker Street. Motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item number 13, over in Dorchester. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80, Section 80E-6 of the Zoning Code for the construction of a mixed-use building consistent of, consisting of 40 residential rental units, including five EDP, IDP units, 3,000 square feet of commercial yes, retail yes, space, 1,815 square feet of multi-purpose space serving the Lutheran Church and community with 23 garage parking spaces located at 500 Talbot Ave and to take all related actions. John. Thank you, Chairman Burke, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. Uh, this mi mixed use development is in Dorchester. Uh, the project site is also located about one block north of Peabody Square uh, within walking distance to Ashmont Station. The proponents, JPA Development Company, filed an Article 80 application on September 11th, and the comment period concluded on October 12th. Uh, the development team did a lot of outreach in the community during the pre-file phase, and the proposal was well, well received. Uh, the, the community really likes the community, community benefit aspect of this proposal, specifically the commitment of $250,000 in funding to reconstruct the Argyle Street and Talbot Avenue intersection. Uh, the development team will, de will detail um, uh, what, what this um, reconstruction entails during their presentation. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, John Polgini, who furthered the presentation. John? Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Secretary Palamas. Um, as John said, my name is John Polgini, and I'm here, and I'm excited to be representing the development team for 500 Talbot Ave in Dorchester. Uh, together with me um, today, this afternoon, we have James Baker, who's the owner developer, together, uh, and also Kevin Diebler from Rody Architects. Uh, John did a great job of highlighting the community process and giving an outline of the proposed project. In addition to his remarks, our team is pleased to contribute what we feel will, is a project that will encompass the city's goals towards sensible neighborhood development. Presently on this site sits a dilapidated Our Savior's Lutheran Church, and through a true partnership, the developer has worked with the parish for the development of over 1,800 square feet of interior church space that will allow the congregation the opportunity to have services in a beautiful and updated area. Our team has worked closely with the residents, civic associations, and the BPDA staff to ensure that the proposal before you will provide an added vitality to the spectacular neighborhood. This proposed development is well served by the public transportation within walking distance of both Ashmont and Shawmut MBTA stations for easy commuting to all points downtown. On behalf of the development team, we're excited to be implement the proposed project and we seek your effort in the support. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to James Baker and he could walk you through a little more of the process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, as John pointed out, uh, we did do an extensive community outreach process. Uh, spent almost two years, various meetings, met with five civic groups, uh, sent out 200 direct mailings to uh, abutters from a list that was provided by the mayor's office, had extensive community meetings uh, and to engage. We also used the co-urbanized website, which uh, generated over 1,000 comments, which were almost 80% positive. 10% you know, negative and then 10% neutral. So we had a very positive um, response to, to, the, to the design process and, and uh, we're, we're very excited to move forward with this um, idea. So I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Diebler, our architect from Rody, to go through some of the design elements. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, James. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Kevin Diebler, Rudy Architects. Uh, pleased to be here tonight to uh, quickly run down some of the uh, aspects of the design of this uh, project. Um, we've, we've gone through some of these uh, features of the uh, engagement. Uh, 40 units, uh, 23 parking spaces are the uh, general metrics of this uh, proposed project. Um, the site uh, to orient you, uh, Talbot uh, and Argyle are the main uh, streets abutting the property. Uh, Talbot at this point connects Codman Square to Peabody Square and the Ashmont neighborhood. Um, and one of the first things that you'll see on this site is sort of a large asphalt area right in front of the uh, church property. Um, and this is one of the sort of defining features, one of the harshest sort of existing conditions of uh, the public realm. Um, site plan will show sort of essentially two spaces that are uh, common, uh, neighborhood amenities, the retail, as well as the remainder of the parish uh, working itself into a smaller footprint. Um, in that process of engagement, and especially working with the abutters, we learned about uh, their desire to try to take care of this uh, intersection. So one of our, our key features uh, of mitigation really is to uh, make this uh, area a little bit uh, friendlier for, especially for pedestrians. Uh, that sort of harsh asphalt environment is, is unsafe. Um, and working with neighbors and abutters, uh, we've been able to straighten out this intersection and make it uh, a little bit uh, more green and easier for pedestrians to navigate. Um, the few plans that I'll show here just show that the parking is fully below grade, 23 spaces to support that 40 units, uh, responsible uh, transit uh, ratio, uh, since we're very well connected to both Shamit and the uh, Ashmont key stations on the red line. Um, the ground floor plan shows the position of these two uh, retail and neighborhood amenities. Uh, that kind of has a through lobby that cuts through and makes connections to the neighborhood. Um, sort of looking at the design, the, generally we are uh, working to sort of connect the mass of the building to the adjacent neighborhood, which is, or uh, buildings on this street, which are three families. Um, and then it sort of works itself up to this corner element and due to the sort of large open space, we've always sort of looked at this as being a place for special design and architecture. Um, and finally, the, the last slide really kind of zeroes in on the, the retail space that, as Jay mentioned, James mentioned, we worked through co-urbanized co to collect a lot of uh, data about how and what the neighborhood wants here. So uh, we find that this would be a, a great element to sort of activate uh, the street. Uh, that concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Are there any questions from the board? I have a question. Um, can we just go back to one of the renderings? I'm, I'm a little bit confused on where the church portion of it goes. Sure. And this this rendering or the um, well, this is the ground floor plan. So that church would be right here, and this is um, essentially not a traditional church, as in a sort of Sunday services, there would be um, activity like that, but there, the parish itself is changing its mission, so it, it uh, is working a little bit more into a storefront type of uh, operation, uh, if that's sort of an accurate yeah, depiction the, of that. The church is looking at having dual uses. It could potentially be co-working space, it could be a coffee shop, it could be any number of things that will also work in church services on Sunday. So it's not gonna be a traditional church space. Okay. What was it before? Before was it a traditional? There was a traditional church on, on, on the site. There is now, currently. It's kind of hard to see with the uh, some of the lighting, but this essentially, as you see, is a, a, a pitched roof. It has a steeple. Um, and how, how receptive was the, I guess, can you tell a little bit about your workings with the, with the congregation and church community and just kind of reception from the congregation itself? They, I mean, we've um, we've talked to the, to the church for two years. They're totally on board. The church and the congregation. They're, they're Excuse me. Can you step up to the microphone so people? Um, we've been working with the church for almost two years, and including congregation <laughs> members, and they're um, totally on board with this vision and this plan. Okay. And from a parking perspective, those twenty-three. Unions are those just specifically for the people who live in the residential area yes. of that? Okay. 
Yes. And so any kind of church parking park would have to be? Would be on street, on street, which is what it is now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If there's no further questions, a uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Congratulations. Item number 14, request authorization to execute an off-site housing creation agreement for Seaport Square Block M. Ashling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the board. On May 12, 2016, this board authorized the director to issue a determination waiving further review for the Seaport Square Block M development project pursuant to a project update letter received by the BPDA on April 4, 2016. As described in the project update letter, the Seaport Square Block M project includes the construction of three residential towers with retail and related commercial uses on the first two floors, totaling approximately 887,000 square feet of residential space, approximately 125,000 square feet of retail space, and below grade parking. The project is currently under construction. This board's 2016 approval of the Seaport Square Block M project <coughs> included the creation of 62 units of off-site affordable housing. The proponent has partnered with the South Boston Neighborhood Development Corporation to create 16 units of affordable housing at 206 West Broadway in South Boston, and for this, has received a credit of 14 units towards their off-site op unit obligation. BPDA Housing Policy Manager Tim Davis, who couldn't be here tonight, has worked diligently with the development team to find an appropriate location within the South Boston neighborhood for the remaining balance of off-site affordable units. BPDA staff is pleased to support the recommendation before you this afternoon for an off-site housing creation agreement to provide 55 low-income elderly units on phase 3C of the old colony chapter 121A project in South Boston. While these units will be built on the old colony project site, they will not be counted towards the original Boston Housing Authority replacement units and as such will all be net new units on the site. The units created at Old Colony Phase 3C will be smaller than the affordable units created on Seaport Square Block M itself, and as such, the proponent will receive a credit of 45 units towards the remaining off-site affordable housing unit obligation. Approval of this recommendation will leave an outstanding balance of three units of off-site affordable housing to be created in connection with the May 2016 Seaport Square Block M approval. The proponent is working to find a location for the creation of these three remaining units in South Boston. Rebecca Matson is in attendance this afternoon on behalf of the Seaport Square Block M development team, and both I and Rebecca would be happy to answer any questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ashley. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Ashley. Item number 15, request authorization to resend the July 12, 2018 vote for the Affordable Rental Housing Agreement and restrictions for 4281 Washington Street project in Rosendale, Ashland. Thank you and good afternoon again, Mr. Chairman, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the board. On July 12, 2018, this board authorized the director to enter into an affordable rental housing agreement and restriction in connection with the project at 4281 Washington Street in Rosendale, as proposed by Corvo Development. At the time of this board's July 12th vote, the proposal called for the construction of a 12-unit residential rental building, of which two units would be IDP units, per this board's vote, and 10 units would be market rate units, with an additional 12 at-grade parking spaces. The City of Boston Zoning Board of Appeals heard the case on July 25th, 2017, and relief was granted subject to BPDA design review. While the project did not meet the threshold of Article 80 small project review, the original proposal called for the construction of 12 units, and as such, require compliance with the inclusionary development policy dated December 10th, 2015. On October 1st, 2018, the BPDA received notification from the developer through their legal counsel that the originally proposed project had been reduced to nine units through the process of review by the Inspectional Services Department. As a nine unit residential building, the revised project at 4281 Washington Street in Rosendale is no longer subject to the inclusionary development policy dated December 10th, 2015. And as a result, the affordable rental housing agreement and restriction authorized by this board's July 12th vote will not be executed. Happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ashley. Are there any questions from the board? Yeah, I, I find it very troublesome that uh, this particular development uh, now arbitrarily is being reduced in size in a way that uh, eliminates the need to provide affordable housing. Uh, what is the developer's intention here? 
uh, what process was gone through, um, and um, why is this happening? Yeah, so I, I don't know that it was the developer's intention for this to result. Um, again, I think it was as a result of design review with ISD and their processes. I have an email here from the development team that we received in their council that outlines what happened. Um, the reason for the reduction is that the developer was called out by I ISD on a building code violation regarding egress. My understanding is that was a rear staircase. We met with both Tom O'Donnell and Tom White, and the only other way to go forward would be to appeal the building code violation, which is a long and complicated process. As the issue comes to fire safety, it was felt that the best solution would be the reduction. So that was the information we were provided with. So a rear staircase is leading to the elimination of affordable units. That's the information we were provided with. Okay, if there's no further questions, uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. The ayes have it. Thank you, Ashley. Item number 16, request authorization to issue a determination waiving the requirement of further review pursuant to Article 80, Section 80A-6.2 of the Zoning Code for the 47 through 55 LaGrange Street project as modified by the notice of project change from up to 130 rental units to up to 176 <coughs> rental units including 23 IDP units, and to take all related actions. Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Director Golden, and Madam Secretary. As you may recall, the 47 to 55 LaGrange Street project, located in the Midtown Cultural District, was originally approved by this board on June 15, 2017. At that time, the project comprised an approximately 157,000 square foot, 21-story residential building that was to include up to 130 rental units and 1,500 square feet of associated retail space. The project complied with the IDP requirement by committing that 13% of the units on site would be designated as IDP units, a total of 17 at that time. On September 12, 2018, QMG LaGrange LLC submitted a notice of project change to the BPDA. The NPC proposes to change the previously approved project from 130 units to 176 units by making some of the units slightly smaller. No other as aspect of the project, such as the building size or the exterior design, is proposed to change. The project will still comply with the IDP policy by designating up to 23 units as IDP units. A uh, BPDA-sponsored public meeting was held on October 22, 2018 to discuss the NPC and the comment period expired on November 5, 2018. The project will continue to undergo design review to ensure compliance with Massachusetts Law Chapter 57 of the Acts of 2017. At this time, I'd like to introduce John Madison from the development team to further the project presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is John Madison with QMG LaGrange development team. Um, thank you for your time. We, uh, the, the goal here is to um, hit the uh, just kind of talk about the project. As Casey said, project has not changed the uh, the, the exterior or square footage. Um, all we're going to be talking about is the uh, number of units. So when we officially filed um, our uh, memo to the to the board uh, to, to the BRA, sorry, <laughs> um, we asked for 176 units. When we went through the PPDA um, board meeting, we've lowered that to 130. And then following that, because we needed some zoning relief, we had zoning relief, um, which included uh, the 176 uh, units. So we, um, through our process over the last year, um, we, we'd like to go back to the original plan of 106 units, which will also increase the, uh, the number of uni affordable units on site uh, at the project. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're here to ask for, is the uh, approval back to the 176 with with a 13% affordable on-site. Um, um, unit changes, it's just the, the square footage of the size of the units. Has, the original plan had eight, six, and four units on each four floor going up. Here we'll do more of a 10 and eight unit uh, project. More 10 units in the lower floors, eight units in the upper floors. Even the smallest of the units will still be um, within the requirements of, of, uh, of, of uh, square footage wise for this for the city uh, on square footage 
Um, we're going to add uh, the basement space. We'll have some amenity space. On the retail space, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to have um, a cafe and uh, entrance into the residential project. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the board? Was there any neighborhood reaction to going back to 176 units? Um, no, I mean, that was kind of the, the main discussion of the public hearing. Um, we talked about how going back to those, that unit count would increase the affordable um, unit count. And are the smallest units uh, still larger than the new compact units? Yes, yes, that's, I'm sorry, that's what I meant to say um, in my statement. Uh, the smallest studio units here are 350 um, square feet on, uh, for the studio, but more likely there'll be more in that four, 450 range. Thank you. Mr. Kipley, what, what exactly was the main driver of, of the change to, to increase? Yeah, well, um, really it's just kind of market driven. Yeah, as you mentioned, there's a lot of talk um, in the marketplace about smaller units and, and that. And um, as we kept doing more and more research, we even, we worked, we were talking uh, quite, a, quite a while with a co-living group on this building and you know when you look at at those units in the 200 250 square foot range yeah we just we kind of just came to the, c the conclusion that um you know it's just smaller seems to be better right now um and it, it you know it's a price point uh, piece but at the same time you know it, it it you know you're able to get more units you're able to serve serve more uh renters um but at the same time you know we're you know our units still are pretty good, you know, good size. You know, we're, we're still 700 plus square foot one bedrooms. This project is um, adjacent to a uh, thriving uh, college. Mm -hmm. um, is there any indication that these smaller units are intended to uh, be a supplement to that college's dormitory plans? Oh, no, not at all, not at all. We've had no discussion with them. Okay, if there's no further questions, then a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 17. Request authorization to adopt the first amendment to the report and decision for parcels 1B and 1C, Chapter 121A project, the Beverly, for zoning deviation to the retail component. Casey. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Director Golden, and Madam Secretary. As you may recall, the parcels 1B and 1C 121A project, now known as the Beverly, was approved by this board on August 13, 2015. The project, which is now substantially complete, consists of a vibrant mixed-use development comprising approximately 484,000 square feet of gross floor area, including 239 affordable and workforce units, a 220-key hotel, and approximately 10,000 square feet of restaurant and retail uses on the ground floor with the associated parking. On October 31st, 2018, Beverly Street Acquisition Retail One Owner Limited Partnership filed an application for approval of additional zoning deviations specifically for the retail component. The applicant has successfully entered into a lease with a tenant who intends to provide a recreational use, um, more specifically a rock climbing gym, but this use is not allowed within the Central Artery Special District, which the project falls in and would otherwise need a variance. The applicant has reviewed the proposal with the members of the community and the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services at a meeting held on premises on October 15, 2018, and there, no, there were no objections to the use. Um, members of the development team are here, should you have any questions? Okay, thank you, Casey. Are there any questions on the board? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, ayes have it. Thank you, Casey. Item number 18, <coughs> request authorization to adopt the second amendment to the report and decision to the Victoria Apartments Chapter 121A project, which involves new mortgage financing, capital improvements, and alterations, and to take all related actions. Mallory. Thank you, Chairman, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. The Victoria Apartments Chapter 121A project consists of 190 residential rental units and approximately 6,815 square feet of commercial community space located on West Newton Street, Tremont Street, San Juan Street, West Brookline Street, Aguadilla Street, 
West Dedham Street and Shawmut Ave in the South End neighborhood of Boston. On October 31st, 2018, the owner filed with the BPDA an application for approval of new mortgage financing and capital improvements and alterations for the project. The owner has applied to the Massachusetts Housing Partnership Fund Board for up to 50, 50 million in new financing to be secured by a first mortgage lien on the project. The financing will be used to repay the current senior loan balance, finance the capital improvements within the project, and replenish replacement reserves. Additionally, an approximately 19 million in equity takeout will be used by the Victoria Apartment uh, Limited Partner Nonprofit Sponsor, IBA, to further its nonprofit purposes, limited to the South End and surrounding neighborhoods of Boston. In connection with this refinancing, the owner intends to renew its Section 8 contract for an additional 20 years. The owner agrees that the BPDA shall be entitled to enforce the affordability restrictions contained in the new MHP regulatory agreement. And the owner will continue to use the project for affordable housing and related community and recreation purposes and the provision of commercial office and retail space with no changes to the existing tenement levels. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Just a comment, I, I commend the, uh, the development and management team and really the uh, community for um, uh, saving a project which uh, was initially transformative of the South End and which has uh, contributed substantially uh, uh, not only to the affordable housing stock in the city but uh, also culturally um, over the years uh, in terms of its programming. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see this financing that permits uh, that community to be uh, carried on uh, for uh, an extended period. So if there's no further questions, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you. Item number 19, request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80, Section 80E-6 of the Zoning Code for the construction of mixed-use building consisting of 49 residential units, including six IDP units, with 34 off-street parking spaces and bicycle storage located at 205 Maverick Street, and to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for the necessary zoning relief and to take all related actions. Raul. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Chairman Burke, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the Board. Uh, just for the record, as a result of a recent ongoing conversation, I'd just like to update the Board uh, for the record that the project will now include seven IDP units, which is an increase from what was uh, an initially anticipated as part of the project. I'll get into that momentarily. Uh, but specifically, as it relates to this particular item, uh, this is the 205 Maverick Street project in East Boston. Uh, the project site consists of 18,000 square feet of land and is currently occupied by a single story uh, commercial structure, which is home to the Maverick Street Market convenience store, a laundromat, and surface parking. Uh, the proposal before you today consists of the demolition of that structure and the construction of a mixed-use building with, uh, with 49 residential rental units, about 3,200 square feet of retail space, and 34 off-street parking spaces. Uh, as it relates to the Article 80 process, uh, the proponent began the small project review process when they submitted their review application uh, to the BPDA on June 29, 2018, which triggered a public comment period, which ultimately concluded on August 7, 2018. Uh, during the public comment period, a BPDA-sponsored and advertised public meeting was held on July 31st at the Embassy Suites Hotel in East Boston, which was very well attended. Uh, I think in addition to the BPDA public review process, the proponent also conducted additional community outreach with the Butters, local elected officials, the, and the Gulf Street Citizens Association to solicit their input on the proposed project uh, prior to and during the Article 80 review process. Uh, as a result of the feedback obtained during the review process, the proponent made a number of revisions to the proposal, including a reduction in the overall number of residential units, a reduction in the building footprint. Uh, they will now be exceeding uh, the 13% IDP requirement, uh, which was the change I referenced at the, the beginning of my remarks. And uh, they also made adjustments to the building mass and to make it better fit into the existing neighborhood context. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to Joe Hanley, Council for the Development Team, to further the presentation. So thank you, Raul. Thank you, Raul. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, 
uh, Director Golden, Attorney Joe Hanley, McDermott, Colty Miller. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Raul and the senior staff uh, with the BPDA for helping us um, deliver what we consider to be a very positive community-based development for this site. Um, just to give you a brief overview, and then I'll have uh, Dan take you through quickly the, uh, the plans. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity to the extent that um, this is a, an existing sort of non-conforming site and use in a residential neighborhood that has had a neighborhood market there for a number of years and is essentially surrounded by an asphalt parking lot. Uh, we call it, and it is, a development without displacement in that uh, we are retaining the market and providing a new space for it to continue to serve the neighborhood uh, in a more modern and contributory kind of fashion. As you'll see, we're investing a lot in the public realm and the act in the activation of the streetscape and in be better accessibility. Uh, for the residential use that's being addressed, as Raul indicated, we're, we're pleased to uh, voluntarily exceed the IDP limits a little bit, uh, especially to provide a little more opportunity for those from the workforce and to enhance what is already um, an important location uh, in this neighborhood. The final thing I would say is I'd like to thank um, all the folks that came out and, and participated in the community outreach process. You received uh, some 420 comments, 400 of them in support, many new to the process, uh, many uh, who live there and are residents but for the first time got involved because they see this as something very positive. And so I, I thank them and the leadership and the elected officials for that. Um, our development team, uh, Joe Najira, uh, was born in East Boston, lived in East Boston, and is a local developer. Very excited uh, to get involved in this site. And Dan Chen, who I'd like to ask to come up here and take you through uh, quickly the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Chairman, Board, and Secretary, Director Golden. Um, at 205 Maverick Street, um, we're, as Joe mentioned, we're in East Boston in the Jeffrey Point neighborhood. They are um, 49 units. The breakdowns are 12 um, studios, 22 bedrooms, and 17 one bedrooms. Um, there's 34 on site, off street parking. The site um, to your to the north is Maverick Street, which is at the intersection of Maverick and Frankfurt Street. Maverick Station on B, uh, MBTA is is five minutes walk to the lower left. This is the current state. Um, looking at directly at the site, this is the one story building. This is looking down Frankfurt Street. As you can see, the neighborhood is primarily three um, triple decker type of um, up apartment. The, um, the site is 180 feet wide and 100 feet long, so it's 18,000 square feet. To brief you, to quickly take you through the landscape plan, um, the landscape improvements is primarily on Maverick Street, which is to the uh, lower part of the plan, whereas new pavers, um, as well as trees, and the the project also includes a courtyard in a entry court of Maverick Street. The rear of the side of the building is uh, uh, surface parking for 34 spaces. The surrounding abutters um, will be improved with a fence um, around three sides. Ground floor plan, there are 3,200 square feet of retail and um, as well as parking. The elevation um, in toward the front of the build, uh, front of the street at Maverick is four stories, and it's, it rises to five stories in the back. This is in keeping of the um, to uh, try to keep keeping with the neighborhood. Um, the materials are principally brick on the front, as well as um, cement boards and hardy siding. This is the rear of the building. Um, there are a fence with the abutters, as well as um, some balconies off the backside. Um, side elevation, um, again, just looking at the fence, as well as the uh, massing of the building. As mentioned before, the towards the Maverick Street, which is considered front, would be brick, and siding would be in the back. 
This is an aerial view from the back, uh, looking at the building. As you can see, the front part towards Maverick is four stories, and the back is five stories. And uh, there's a roof deck on, on, the, uh, on the roof. Um, the, this is looking down Maverick Street. The idea here is really trying to activate the ground, the streetscape. So um, the entry court, the retail are trying to be transparent as well as open um, and improve the Maverick Street. This is looking down the other side of Maverick Street. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, it does. Okay. Are there any questions from the board? Um, I have a question. Um, so the overwhelming theme in, in the, uh, some of the opposition comments is around parking. Um, can you expand a little bit on kind of how you chose this parking ratio and what is the parking situation in general with all the development that's kind of going into this um, this area. Yeah, th uh, thank you. So uh, we have 34 on-site parking spaces for 49 vehicles. Um, originally, this project, as it was uh, filed and went through the process at 55 units with seven affordable, and then, as Raul indicated, through the process, we agreed to essentially uh, make it a main four-story building with a fifth-level setback from the front thereby reducing the number of units for a better correlation. The other piece of this, this is a rental building uh, with respect to uh, the residential, which within a four minute walk to the T. So we think it's a good ratio based on that. Again, also with respect to the price of vehicle ownership with respect to housing. And the other piece I'd add, which is a little unique here, is uh, in the beginning I showed you, there's, there's these vast kind of curb cuts that are there now, many of which are being sealed. So there's an opportunity also for short-term short street parking for the market uh, that we think also kind of helps to address the issues. So it's that kind of combination as well as the unique location of the site. Uh, we think 34 spaces with those other amenities help. Okay, if there's no further questions, then a motion is in order. I just have one more question. What, what is the market rate for parking units in a building like this, like per month? What are, what are people being asked to pay? I think they're being asked. Um, yeah. Please step up to the uh, microphone. <laughs> I think about 100 a month. 100 a month. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you. Congratulations. Item number 20, request authorization to enter into an amended and restated land disposition agreement in connection with parcel R-7A, 7C1A, located at 51 Chappie Street, allowing the change of use from a two-family house to a three condominium units. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. The project before you is Urban Renewal Parcel R-7C-1A. It consists of 3,883 square feet of land at 51 Chappie Street in Charlestown. The present owners, the Chardevoin family, are requesting a change from a two-family structure to a three-family condominium structure. An amended and restated land disposition agreement will be executed to reflect this change. The additional unit will be subject to a $15,000 payment to the BRA. Going forward, each initial sale will be required to pay the BRA 4% of the initial gross sales price and any subsequent sale will be required to pay 2% of the gross sales price. A community meeting was held on July 19, 2018 and all of the attendees voiced their strong support for the project. I just have a few slides I want to draw your attention to. It's the existing site. Um, we will be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Item number 21, request authorization to enter into an amendment to the land disposition agreement with Joseph M. Wren for 21 Wellesley Street located within parcel R-481C, adding exemptions to the resale payment 
and to enter into any and all amendments to the land disposition agreements that do not include the allowed exemptions. Michael. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. The lender for the owner has reached out to us to request an amendment to the land, disposi land disposition agreement to add exemptions to the resale payment language. Essentially, the property was sold from the previous owner, Joseph Wren, to the new owner, Joseph McKeever, by quick claim deed in July of 2014. Mr. McKeever is in the process of refinancing and his lender has asked for exemptions to be added. These exemptions include the following. Any foreclosure or deed in lieu of foreclosure by any mortgagee, any sale of a market rate unit by a mortgagee that was acquired by foreclosure or deed in lieu of foreclosure, any involuntary transfer by reason of death, condemnation, bankruptcy, or operation of law, and any involuntary or voluntary bankruptcy, receivership, assignment for the benefit of creditors, or any similar insolvency proceeding under federal or state law. We are asking for a vote to amend the LDA to allow for these exemptions and to also amend any other LDA to contain these exemptions where resale payment language exists, but the exemptions do not exist. We will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, a motion's in order? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank, thank you, Michael. You. Item number 22. Request authorization to adopt an order of taking for areas within parcel 27, consisting of portions of Boylston Street, Cambria Street, St. Cecilia Street, and Scotia Street for the 1000 Boylston Street project and to execute all necessary documents and to take all related actions. Janet. Thank you. Chairman Burke, members of the board, Director Golden and Secretary Polhemus. The actions before you today are in connection with the 1000 Boylston project, which we have up there. This project is being built on a Prudential parcel, a parcel located above the turnpike between Prudential parcel and Cambria Street parcel, which is owned by MassDOT and known as parcel 15. The Scotia parcel, which is located across Cambria Street from parcel 15, and a parcel comprised of above grade air rights spanning Cambria Street between parcel 15 and the Scotia parcel, as well as air rights and subsurface rights within Boylston Street, um, St. Cecilia Street, Scotia Street, and Dalton Street. The BRA is assisting in the developer's acquisition of the areas within Boylston Street, Cambria Street, St. Cecilia Street, and Scotia Street, not Dalton Street. Um, and these are within parcel 27. Do you want to, can you go? Oh, thank you. Uh, parcel 27 is a really weird shape because it's all around and a little bit in the middle of where it's being built. Um, and uh, let's see, so it's within parcel 27 of the Fenway Urban Renewal Area. We're acquiring the areas, which are about 23 or 24 areas in this um, of air rights and subsurface and as well as surface rights through eminent domain. We're discontinuing the public way rights in the areas through the City of Boston Public Improvement Commission and we're transferring the areas to the 1000 Boylston Street owner LLC, the developer. On July 12, 2018, the board authorized the director to co-petition for the discontinuance of portions of Boylston Street, Cambria Street, St. Cecilia Street, and Scotia Street within parcel 27 that are owned by the City of Boston. Today, the board is being asked to adopt an order taking to acquire by eminent domain the portions of Boylston Street, Cambria Street, St. Cecilia Street, and Scotia Street within parcel 27 that are owned by the City of Boston and are being discontinued and to authorize the director to enter into and execute a deed, a land disposition agreement, and an indemnification agreement within 1,000, uh, with the 1,000 Boylston Street owner LLC, the developer, in connection with these areas, and to authorize the director to execute a deed transferring um, the remaining portion of a registered parcel that we're deregistering as part of this process that remains in Cambria Street back to the city of Boston. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from the board? We're, we're taking um, an area here and if I understand this uh, correctly, portions of the public access to this area will be discontinued. Right, it's air rights, subsurface rights. Okay, uh, so what, what if anything will assure that there'll still be public access to this area? Uh, well, no, we're just doing along the sides of the roads. The only one that's really impacted a lot is Cambria Street, because we're taking above it. That's the street that goes down and is the um, loading dock area right. for Heinz. They'll still have that access. 
And I think there's also a turnoff for a parking structure under there. That'll still be all available. <coughs> and PIC is the one discontinuing it. They'll make sure everyone has the right thing. Okay. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed, the ayes have Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 23. Request authorization to co-petition the Public Improvement Commission for the discontinuance of a portion of Dalton Street to adopt an order of taking for parcel 26 located on Dalton Street to execute all necessary documents and to take all related actions. Casey. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Director Golden and Madam Secretary. As you know, the eastern portion of the Belvedere Dalton site within planned development area number 80, Christian Center Plaza, was approved by this board back in 2013. Now known as One Dalton, the project consists of a 58-story tower which is currently under construction and when complete will house the new Four Seasons Hotel and private residences. In connection with the One Dalton project, a 121-square-foot parcel of land on Dalton Street comprising parcel 26 in the Fenway Urban Renewal Area is necessary for the construction of the hotel vestibule. In order for the developer to acquire the necessary area, the land must first be acquired by the BRA and discontinued as a public way by the City of Boston Public Improvement Commission. Upon the discontinuance, the BRA shall transfer the portion of parcel 26 to the developer for the construction of the hotel vestibule. Members of the development team are available should you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Casey. Are there any questions on the board? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you, Casey. Item number 24. Oh, we're going to hold off till 5:30. That's a public hearing. We'll hold off. I'm going to move to item number 26. We will do the public hearings at 5:30. Item number 26. Request authoriz authorization to disperse $82,215 of the BioSquare 2 mitigation funds to Project Place for the beautification of the Massachusetts Avenue and Molina Cass area. Sonnell. Good afternoon, Chairman Burke, member of the board, Madam Secretary, Director Golden. Uh, this board approved the BioSquare 2 project in December of 2004. At that, at that point, the proponent, BioSquare 2, submitted funds to us to be administered uh, by the BRA that will provide for physical and community improvements. These funds will allow for Project Place, a 50-year-old social services agency located in the South End neighborhood of Boston to do outdoor cleaning for the Melnia Cass and Mass Ave area and in excess of 63,000 square feet of sidewalk and grassy area. Okay, thank you, Sonal. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Sonal. Item number 27, personnel. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. We have three travel items for your consideration with details listed in the board memo. Jill Oxick, landscape architect from the planning division. Brian Golden, director of BPDA, and Michael Christopher, deputy director of development review from the development review division. And we have one departure with details listed in the board memo. John O'Brien from the Real Estate Division. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, a motion's in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. <coughs> Item number t 28, contractual. We need a motion to pay the bills. I move we pay our bills. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Item 29 is the director's update. Would you like to speak now, Mr. Director, or do you prefer to wait? <laughs> I'll defer, Mr. Chairman. You'll Thank wait. you. Okay. So we're going to, the, the only remaining business is the last two hearings. We're just so efficient, in case you're, you know, <laughs> that we uh, are moving right along. We'll have to resume at 5.30 when the uh, public hearings uh, can commence then. Um, that's when they were advertised to start, and we're not able to um, start any earlier than that. So we'll be back at 5.30 sharp. Thank you.
This was a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency, being held under Massachusetts General Laws 121A and Acts of 1960, Chapter 652, both as amended, and Boston Redevelopment Authority rules and regulations governing 121A projects in the city of Boston, adopted 1978 as amended, regarding the proposed Old Colony Phase 3 Chapter 121A project and the Old Colony Phase 3 C Chapter 121A project, the Old Colony Phase 3 B Chapter 121A project, includes the demolition of 94 units and the new construction of 115 units in four-story elevator <coughs> buildings. Old Colony Phase 3C will consist of the, the demolition of 41 units and the new construction of 55 units in service and rich housing for seniors and peoples with disabilities in the area of South Boston. This hearing was duly advertised on November 3, 2018 in the Boston Herald. In a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency, staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, others who wish to speak in favor of the proposed petition are afforded an opportunity to do so under the same rules of questioning. Following that, those who wish to speak in opposition may do so again under the same rules of questioning. Finally, the proponents are allowed for a period of five to ten minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Mr. Campbell will now present. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Madam Secretary. Um, as you may recall, on February 8, 2018, the board adopted a report and decision approving the proposed project under General Laws 121A in connection with the first leg of the three separate projects in the Old Colony Phase Three project. Today's public hearing is focused on the second and third legs of the overall phase three project. Um, building on its success of Old Colony phases one and two, one and, two <coughs> and continuing the Old Colony master plan that was approved in 2011, we're happy to have the BHA and Beacon communities ready to proceed on the Old Colony phase three as a whole. Um, uh, 3B and uh, uh, phase 3C projects. Phase 3A focused on in February on 135 housing units to be constructed and two new four-story buildings which are known as buildings A-1 and A-2. Phase 3B consists of 115 new housing units and Phase 3C consists of 55, as the chairman so eloquently said, 55 housing units that will be used as serviced and rich housing for seniors and people with disabilities. Staff respectfully, respectfully request that um, you authorize to adopt the Old Colony Phase 3, 4B Limited Partnership, Old Colony Phase 3, B9 Limited Partnership, and Old Colony Phase 3C Limited Partnership, Chapter 121A project applications located in South Boston for the construction of Phase 3B consisting, as I said, 115 housing units. Phase 3C consisting of 55 housing units. Uh, and to issue a determination waiver requirements uh, with, um, without further review. Uh, with that said, Darcy Jameson from Beacon Communities is here to give a brief overview along with um, the project's counsel, Ruth Silman from, New, uh, from Nixon Peabody. Okay, thank you, Lance. Hi, everybody. Um, on behalf of Beacon Communities and also the Boston Housing Authority, I want to thank the city and the board for your ongoing support of Old Colony. Since, as I always say, this is like Groundhog Day, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I think, as everybody knows, um, Beacon has worked in partnership for, it's approaching almost 10 years, I think, with the Boston Housing Authority to do phases one and two, demolition and new construction. 
Um, we had a little bit of a break and now working on phase three, A, B, and C, as Lance articulated. Uh, I'm happy to report with the city's support and help um, and support from the state, we are actually in closing mode on phase three A, <coughs> looking forward to demolition starting shortly after the new year and then we'll ro roll right into the financial closing and start construction. So that's exciting and right on the heels of that are phases B and C, which is what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, so this is just an overview of all of Old Colony. I think most of you are probably quite familiar with it, but uh, if you're not, you know, this is the entire Old Colony. We've redeveloped phases one and two. We've got the Perkins School right here in the middle, Moakley Park, and this is the phase three area. This is um, a future phase. Some of the images from phases one and two and the Tierney Learning Center, which is where we provide programs and services for folks in the community, really has become the heart of the Old Colony community. Um, and then this just briefly shows you phases one and two. This is building A1 and 2, part of phase 3A, which we'll be getting started on, as Lance mentioned. And then this is phase 3B and 3C. The exciting part about this project, um, I think from my perspective, each phase ends up being a little bit different. But in the phase 3 area, there are 250 units. In phases A and B, we are able to accomplish the one-to-one -one replacement of the 250 apartments, which is exciting because it created a new production opportunity for phase 3C, which will really be new housing in the city. Um, again, another image, uh, the trees have been of paramount importance to preserve in the community and we'll continue to focus on that in this uh, next phase. Um, and that's just the summary of schedule, which I really touched on already. I'll stop there and turn it over to Ruth. Great, thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Director <coughs> Golden, um, Secretary. Uh, I don't have a lot to add. We're here for um, the formal approvals uh, for the Chapter 121A report and decision on Phase 3B, for the 121A report and decision on Phase 3C, and then we did submit the, their, um, the Article 80 Large Project Review um, for all of phase three was approved in February um, of 2018, but we did submit a notice of project change for 3C because it shifted a little bit by way of unit count and a few other things, and so that's why there's a request only at this time for um, a determination under Article 80 for phase 3C. So again, we can get into any level of detail that you'd care to do so. Um, Happy to answer any questions. And just want to thank, again, the board, staff, um, legal counsel, and the city for this tremendous support. This whole neighborhood has really been transformed, and we look forward to continuing it. Okay, thank you very much. Lance, does that conclude the presentation? Okay. So this is a public hearing, so before we have any questions from the board, I'm going to proceed with the public hearing portion. Is there anyone that would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Please step right up. Anyone that would like to speak in favor? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, Mino Ferris, representing the Carpenters Union, would like to go on record with support of this project. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor? <coughs> Is there anyone that would like to speak in opposition? And step right up if there's anyone that would like to speak in opposition. Okay, are there any questions from the board? I, I do have one question regarding, are these uh, units occupied now and also do you have a relocation plan in place for when you do this work and will these people be able to come back to these units? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great question. Similar to all the other phases, the Boston Housing Authority is taking the lead on all of the relocation and residents do have the right to return that are in good standing. So yes. Okay, great. I grew up in that neighborhood and a lot, I might know some of those families that still live there. <laughs> so. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, a motion is in order? So moved. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> okay, item number 25. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Article 80 of the Boston Zoning Code regarding the development plan for planned development area number 121 Kenmore Square redevelopment project 
and two, to consider the Kenmore Square redevelopment project on Beacon Street and Commonwealth Avenue in the Kenmore area of Boston as a development impact project. This hearing was duly advertised on November 3, 2018 in the Boston Herald. In a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency, staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, others who wish to speak in favor of the proposed petition are afforded an opportunity to do so under the same rules of questioning. Following that, those who wish to speak in opposition may do so again under the same rules of questioning. Finally, the proponents are allowed for a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Tim will now start the presentation. I'm going to defer Mr. to Teresa. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we didn't advertise this till 5.45, so we should just wait a couple more minutes until Tim begins his presentation. Two minutes. Sounds good to me. <laughs> two minutes. I'm not reading this again. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? <laughs> We're just so efficient tonight. It's really moving along quickly. We didn't expect that, you know. What a night. <laughs> no. Actually, do I have to, should I read it again at the correct time? Seven minutes. <laughs> we'll be back in five minutes.
We're just going to start over here with item number 25. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency, being held in conformance with Article 80 of the Boston Zoning Code regarding the development plan for planned development area number 121 Kenmore Square redevelopment project and to consider the Kenmore Square redevelopment project on Beacon Street and Commonwealth Avenue in the Kenmore area of Boston as a development impact project. This hearing was duly advertised on November 3, 2018 in the Boston Herald. In a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency, staff members will first present their case in a subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, others who wish to speak in favor of the proposed petition are afforded an opportunity to do so under the same rules of questioning. Following that, those who wish to speak in opposition may do so again under the same rules of questioning. Finally, the proponents are allowed for a period of five to ten minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Tim will now begin the presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. The project site is an approximately 48,654 square foot site currently containing seven buildings, 650 Beacon Street, 652 to 654 Beacon Street, 656 Beacon Street, 660 Beacon Street, 533 Commonwealth Avenue, 535 to 539 Commonwealth Avenue, and 541 Commonwealth Avenue. The project site is in the heart of Kenmore Square, and as you can see from the rendering on the screen, the existing building at 660 Beacon Street is currently home to the Sitco sign. The proponent, Related Beal, proposes a redevelopment that includes preservation and new construction in two principal components. The Commonwealth Avenue building entails demolition of the buildings at 533 to 541 Commonwealth Avenue and construction of an eight-story, approximately 112-foot tall commercial building, including approximately 8,000 square feet of ground floor retail space and approximately 119, excuse me, 119,000 square feet of office space above. Two floors of below grade parking, including approximately 60 spaces, will be at the basement levels. The Beacon Street building entails the demolition of the existing building at 650 to 656 Beacon Street and the construction of an approximately seven story, 100 foot tall building in its place. The Beacon Street building also entails a 66,000 square foot renovation of 660 Beacon Street, which will be connected to the new building. The Beacon building will include approximately 125,000 square feet of office space above approximately 20,500 square feet of ground floor and below grade retail space. The proponent filed a project notification form for the proposed project on May 10th of 2018. A scoping session at BPDA offices was held on May 23rd. A public meeting was held on May 24th and an impact advisory group meeting was held on June 6th. BPDA staff issued a request for supplemental information on July 25th. The proponent filed a response to that request as well as a development plan for a proposed planned development area on September 26th. An additional public meeting was held on October 22nd and an additional IAG meeting was held on October 17th. The proposed project received approval from the Boston Civic Design Commission on November 6th. The proposed project provides a number of public benefits, including the construction of a sidewalk level bicycle track across the length of the project site that will help connect bicycle improvements on Beacon Street on either side of Kenmore Square. A $75,000 contribution to the Emerald Necklace Conservancy for design of a proposed Charles Gate Park, a crucial link between the Charles River, River Esplanade, the Commonwealth Avenue Mall, and the Back Bay Fens and expanded and enhanced uh, sidewalks and pub public realm around the, pub uh, the project site. The project has been designed to contribute to the existing context of Kenmore Square and to not overwhelm existing view corridors through the square and up to the Sitco sign, which was designated as a landmark by the Boston Landmarks Commission this week. Additional public benefits are outlined in your board memo as well as on the screen. The proposed project is a development impact project with approximately 272,500 square feet of dip uses. The proposed project will provide an estimated $1,557,675 to the Neighborhood Housing Trust and an estimated $307,050 to the Neighborhood Jobs Trust. BPDA staff believes that the proposed project will be a positive addition to the Kenmore Square neighborhood and is recommending approval of the proposed project. I'll now ask Patrick Sweeney from Related Beal to introduce his team and present the project and we'll be happy to answer any questions after that presentation. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you to the members of the board and Director Golden. My name is Patrick Sweeney. I'm a managing director with Related and project manager uh, on this project where we are seeking the approval of the Kenmore Square Redevelopment Project with respect to Article 80B and Article 80C of the Zoning Code. We have several members of our Related Development Team here tonight. Um, Andrew Hayes, Alex Provost, Stephen Ng, uh, as well as a great team of consultants. And in a couple minutes, I will hand it over to our architect, Roger Ferris, um, to talk about the design on the project. Tim spoke uh, already to um, the approvals, so um, just very quickly, from our perspective, um, we really started this process in the summer of 2017. We ultimately filed our LOI in January of <coughs> 2018. Um, our PNF was then filed in May, and we had several meetings with the BCDC over the <coughs> course of the last few months um, before receiving our final approval last week. Uh, Tim also mentioned the mitigation and public benefits, which we've outlined on this si slide. Um, I won't read it, um, partially because I can't read it, but, um, <laughs> but from our perspective, I guess, I, you know, our, our main goals were really to um, activate the north side of uh, Kenmore Square, and um, we've also always focused on maintaining the key views of the Sitco sign. So in terms of transaction history, um, we purchased a portfolio of nine buildings from Boston University. Uh, the nine buildings are, are outlined there in, in white. Uh, that was completed in, uh, I think, October of 2016. Um, uh, BU actually uh, continues to uh, own the land on a long-term ground lease. So we're very much uh, attracted by the, the location of this real estate. Um, as you all know, it, it's really at the, the crossroads um, of Fenway Park, of uh, Boston University, Back Bay, um, several streets come together, and we also you know, love the dynamic of um, uh, the access to, to mass transit that's uh, immediately adjacent to the site. Uh, we also felt like the buildings were really ripe for redevelopment. Um, many of them BU had, had owned for um, several decades, but, um, but often not occupied or uh, occupied sparingly and not really invested um, considerably in the, in the buildings. In terms of the current site conditions, um, this slide shows uh, pictures of uh, what is there today. Uh, as I think all of you know, one of the buildings, 660 Beacon, uh, houses the Sitco sign, uh, pictured on the, the left there. Uh, all of our plans have always uh, planned to maintain this building and the sign, and we very much uh, focused on incorporating the sign into our design uh, on the rest of the project. Um, this slide also shows the existing conditions at the, at the property. Um, I think especially if you look at the, the picture on the left, you know, several of the buildings um, are not in great shape. Um, they weren't really conducive to our goals of activating this part of the square, um, particularly the retail um, activation, um, and also trying to attract dynamic tenants to this project. Uh, further to that point, um, this slide shows a few pictures of the other side of the square um, at various events throughout the year. And I think we you know, very much believe that, that we'll be able to activate uh, our portion of the square in a similar manner. So this picture outlines um, s the seven interior buildings of the nine building uh, portfolio that we purchased. These are the buildings where the majority of the renovation work will occur. As we do on most of our um, projects, we look to incorporate or renovate the existing buildings where possible. And overall, we're keeping about 65% of the existing square footage <coughs> in this instance. 
several of the buildings were in disrepair and not functional, and so those buildings, that's approximately 100,000 square feet of space, uh, will be demoed as part of the project. So Jake will discuss the design in more detail, but before handing it over, I wanted to briefly overview the changes to the public realm and transportational improvements that we plan to make. So this uh, diagram outlines the existing curb line and the red dashed line, if you can see it. Um, as you can see, we are extending the sidewalk of Beacon Commonwealth and Deerfield Street to create an accessible means of passage as well as an additional, additional benching, street trees, and added hardscape. There will also be a raised and buffered bike lane that allows for a smoother transition from Beacon Street through Kenmore Square. Also, you can see the beneficial frontage area created in front of the building that is now stepped back and allows for additional areas to be programmed and utilized for the public realm. Um, it's also important to mention that no vehicular traffic lanes will be removed in this expansion. This slide shows the introduction of new street trees, furnishing zones, and the buffered bike lane that have <coughs> been designed by our landscape architect, Kyle Zick. And finally, this slide highlights the significant sidewalk depth we are adding, which will be great for all of the increased traffic that we hope to create on this side of the square. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Jake from Roger Ferris to walk through our design ideas on this project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Jake Watkins. To quickly run through the statistics, um, approximately 272,000 square feet total split up between uh, two different buildings, the Beacon Building and Commonwealth, uh, seven floors and eight floors uh, between the two of them. The site itself uh, is composed of a retail element uh, facing uh, Commonwealth and Beacon Street, um, also turning the corner around Deerfield. There are two office entry points for each building, the Commonwealth Building right here, located off of Deerfield, that's the office entry and the other office entry off of Beacon Street right here. There are two vehicular access points to the rear of the building, which is where the back of house parking and uh, loading is located through two private passageways. Um, both passageways uh, have shared rights by both related deal and the adjacent property owners. Related deal has been working closely with the adjacent property owners to make sure that each private passageway um, be, uh, remains unobstructed through the design process, the construction process, and uh, afterward as well. On the uh, second floor, moving up to the eighth floor, uh, is an office program. At the Commonwealth Building, a single floor plate, approximately 18,000 square feet. And then uh, the, the Beacon Building is a combined uh, footprint of both uh, a new construction portion and the 660 uh, portion, which is an interior um, renovation, extensive interior renovation with a combined footprint. Um, as you see from the massing above, the, of course the Sitco sign is recognized, is um, revealed as the seventh floor and the eighth floor are peeled back to respond to the sign. We've been working closely with the BPDA to maintain uh, the prescribed view corridors that have been given to us um, throughout the process. Um, we've had a five-month review period with the BCDC. It's been a good one um, and worked closely with them to both identify the main components of Kenmore Square and uh, have those resp be responded to in the design itself. The main vehicular pedestrian activity, uh, the street wall component, which really forms the room, um, really uh, is the identity of Kenmore Square. Um, how these intersections are treated how one can actually hold the corner and make a new gateway an identifiable element in Kenmore Square. And then of course, how the design of the response to the sign up above on the top levels. All of these have um, been combined into a complete development that consists of, again, the Beacon Building and the Commonwealth Building. Very simple materials that are um, present in Kenmore Square, brick, glass, uh, masonry. Um, the vertical elements of the Commonwealth Building are maintained and uh, represented and uh, continuous with the existing adjacent buildings as well through these what we're calling flyby uh, elements, really trying to 
relate to the activity, to um, the movement, to um, the pedestrian activity that's present along Beacon Street and Commonwealth. It makes, uh, lends itself to a certain dynamic quality and by using these simple uh, materials, by having the planes themselves actually extend past and um, not just be <coughs> statically placed on the, on the facade. As you turn the corner uh, to Deerfield Street, the facade calms. It relates more to uh, the street wall activity as well that's on Deerfield. At the pedestrian level, as Patrick mentioned, um, <coughs> we are trying to give back to the public realm, creating both a uh, seating area, bike area, pedestrian walkway, and then additional seating elements that relate to the retail and create an indoor-outdoor activity space. And again, how the upper floors really begin to peel back and relate to the sign that's there too, both in material quality and formal quality. The Beacon Building itself really relates to the tripartite um, elements that are adjacent to it. There will be a um, part of the adjacent building that will maintain the retail corridor, um, and it will uh, strongly relate to the horizontal elements that are um, at each um, adjacent building itself while still maintaining a distinct and um, contemporary expression of the existing masonry materials. And this is just showing what the before and after view of the new development would look like in Kenmore Square as it relates to the existing conditions and the existing elements. Thank you very much. Happy okay, to answer thank questions. You. Does that conclude your presentation? It does. Okay. So we'll go into the public uh, testimony portion of this. Is there anyone that would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Please step right up, state your name. Anyone that would like to speak in favor? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, Minor Perez, representing the Carpenters Union. On behalf of hundreds of union carpenters that live and work throughout the city of Boston, what about record and support? Thank okay, you. thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Director Golden, and members of the board. My name is Pamela Beale, and my address is 462 Beacon Street. I'm here this evening in my capacity as president of the Kenmore Association and as a member of the Kenmore Redevelopment Impact Advisory Group to express the community support for this project. We in Kenmore Square feel very fortunate that Boston University chose Related Beale to reimagine the north side of Kenmore Square. Since their acquisition of these properties, Related Beale has worked very hard to engage the community. They spent a great many hours listening to our concerns as well as our hopes for the future of the square. And the project you see before you reflects their efforts to do exactly what the community asked them to do, transform the north side of Kenmore Square into a wonderful, vibrant destination. Accordingly, on behalf of the businesses and residents of Kenmore Square, I urge you to vote in favor of this important project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Good evening, Director Golden, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. My name is Chris Strang, and my address is 566 Commonwealth Avenue. I live in Kenmore Square. I also have had a, owned a small business in Kenmore Square in the buildings in question for the better part of the, the past 10 years. I can tell you, in my own personal experience, I've had water come down on my head from leaking roofs. I've been rescued from the elevators multiple times by firefighters. The plumbing and HVAC <laughs> is a huge problem in these buildings. There are so many problems with the existing buildings, I could not list them all to you. And what I'm saying to you is the buildings that are proposed to be demolished absolutely could not be brought back up to reasonable, accessible use for office space in the current environment. So they need to be torn down and we need new development in Kenmore Square, both to have the opportunity to have our businesses and jobs in the community, but also so that the residents of the community have a more inviting place to walk home after work and not have these decrepit buildings falling down on them. So we heartily endorse the project. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Chairperson Burke, uh, Vice Chairperson Rojas, Director Golden, members of the board. Uh, my name is Brian Doherty. I represent the Building Trades Unions with several of my colleagues in the room. I just want to say tonight that we've enjoyed a, a fantastic relationship and partnership with Related Bill. Uh, they've listened. They've been a team partner. Team. Uh, they've been a team player. And uh, we're proud to be here tonight in support of the project. Thanks very much. Appreciate Thank your efforts. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Tom Ward. I'm on the executive board of Local 7 of the Iron Workers Union, a resident of this city. 
We look forward to working on this project and we rise in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good evening, Director, Mr. Chairman, and the Board. My name is Michael Burns. I am a member of Local 17, the Boston Building Trades, and uh, I also speak in favor uh, of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Mooney. I'm with Beacon Services, um, property manager for 636 Beacon Street. We're a direct abutter to this proposed project. And um, on behalf of the majority of the Board of the Trustees, um, we endorse this project. Um, there are some matters that are still un resolved, uh, but we hope to work with uh, the petitioner to um, resolve those matters. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone that would like to speak in favor? Okay, hearing none, is there anyone that would like to speak in opposition? Please step right up if you'd like to speak in opposition. Mr. Chair, Director Golden, my name is Brian Haney. I'm an attorney for Sitco Petroleum Corporation. Uh, we submitted a letter earlier this week to the uh, BPDA, <clears throat> which I know is on the record. So I'd like to merely amplify just two particular concerns in that letter. One is the impact of the proposed development upon the site views and view corridors of the Sitco sign from various perspectives within the city of Boston. The second is with respect to the actual um, logistics of the development, I understand there'll be what I would call uh, in layman's terms a gut renovation of 660 Beacon where the sign rests and where the interior um, support structures for the sign are as well. We haven't seen any uh, confirmation or even any studies that confirm there will be no impact because this is a very large safety issue. I wanted to bring it to the board's attention once again and just make sure that has been properly taken into account at this stage as well as in all future stages understanding ISD, building department, et cetera will become involved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition? Anyone that would like to speak in opposition, please step right up. Okay, hearing none, are there any questions from the board? I have a couple of uh, design questions, and <coughs> the first of them goes to uh, the comments made by the last speaker. Um, I'm curious about the sight lines even as they stand at this moment and why the uh, top floor uh, could not be peeled back a bit more uh, in order to improve sight lines down Com Ave there for the Sitco side. Um, through the last five months, we've shown probably uh, 20 different view quarter studies um, through the BCDC review process. And I think what they've shown is that essentially the eighth floor element, as it peels back, really gives those view corridor, um, especially from this marathon view, really does show the sign and, and, and maintains those view corridors the way they need to be. The seventh floor does step back from the brick elements, and uh, that step back does give sufficient <coughs> um, uh, uh, leeway to the views so that the Sitco sign is not um, obscured in those views that were given by the BPDA. Okay, my second question relates to the uh, transit uh, improvements. I see that you have a, a cutout or a setback um, along um, what would be, uh, maybe you could uh, get that slide up there. That'll do, yeah. Um, at the area where people would be crossing from the north side of the street to the uh, Kenmore bus station. And I wonder what, if any, and uh, not there, but uh, uh, further uh, down towards town, yes. And I wonder, um, given that people do have a tendency to cross there for the buses, what improvements um, are contemplated to make that a safer uh, place for people to be able to get across to the bus terminal? Well, uh, first in general, along the entire north side of the street, the sidewalk is being widened at every single location to give more um, access and availability. Um, in terms of, I'd have to refer to our uh, traffic consultant for any additional um, means across the street. 
Thank you, members of the board. My name's Sean Manning. I'm the traffic engineer on the project. So to, to answer your question specifically, I mean, really, people should not cross the street there. They should be using the crosswalk at the intersection. So we understand that, but this is this is a stop that's used by a lot of students. So you know, let's be real about who's coming and going from that station. No, I understand that, but 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 really, to cross in the you know in the in the middle of the square with four lanes of traffic, really. I mean, people are doing that at, at risk. They really should not be doing that. And to put a crosswalk there really would not, I mean, that would not be safe at all. That would not be a safe improvement. They really need to use the widened crosswalk. And, and, and the intent of the frontage of the building was to really improve the pedestrian environment. So you have a head house to the, to the green line. Uh, you've got significantly widened sidewalk. And you have now have a separated bike facility. So the bikes are now not in traffic. They're on their own separated bike lane. And really, they need to be directed to the crosswalk to get to the bus station. That's the safe place to cross. I know that, but that's not how people tend to behave in Kenmore Square. Just curious. OK. <clears throat> um, how, how is this building distinguished in terms of uh, its uh, sustainable or resilient elements? Um, there have been several, uh, we're going through an energy analysis of the entire building, and uh, both the uh, vertical elements, shading elements, the recessed um, uh, windows, which are recessed from the facade uh, further, and um, the, um, the additional use of these, excuse me, vertical elements just to give views while not giving direct sunlight into those areas. Okay, so there aren't any uh, uh, green areas as such. Um. Uh, uh, Jeff Starziak, a consultant for the proponent. Um, there's been a lot of changes. The original building was very glassy, which is not all that great for uh, energy conservation. Um, it's been improved significantly. There's fewer windows, which is going to improve the energy performance. They're also going to be, at minimum, the proposals to be lead certifiable at the silver level, um, with always the idea that as the design process moves forward, to try and make it as sustainable as possible. OK, and then finally, uh, you made reference to bringing in uh, dynamic tenants. What does that mean? Stand up. Oh, no, no, you got to stand up to the microphone. We want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> Dynamic tenants. I, um, I, I was just referring to we're, we're very early in our process of, of, of meeting with potential uh, companies, but I think it's important to us, as I mentioned, to activate um, the north side of the square, so in terms of restaurants um, and other places for people to, uh, to interact. I think that's very important. And then um, our office floors, we think these will be great buildings. So we think a wide range of companies would be very interested in locating here. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not asking the question facetiously. Um, you want to enliven this corner. And presumably, that means that you want a significant increase in foot traffic um, on that corner. Um, and, and that additional foot traffic um, during baseball games or certain times of the year for BU um, will very much change the flow of traffic, uh, foot traffic, uh, from the south side to the north side of the street. Um, and uh, from uh, the area of where the hotel is, um, kind of on an island there uh, along Ave, uh, Com Ave. And I'm just wondering what kind of adjustments are anticipated if, as I expect you would be, you are successful in bringing in uh, dynamic tenants uh, that significantly increase the amount of foot traffic on that corner. Right, right. No, I mean, it's a very good question. Uh, thank you. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I mean, I think the, the, the main um, concepts are really, you know, if you can see, it's, I guess, hard to see in this slide how much um, uh, additional sidewalk we are adding. Um, and, you know, between the buffered bike lanes and the trees, um, and then a significant addition to the sidewalk um, to, with, you know, new hardscape to allow for much um, 
uh, a much larger group of people to walk down the street in a hopefully a safer fashion because it's more blocked off the, from the existing roads. Okay. Yeah, I have a question regarding the, the gentleman, the attorney who spoke in opposition. Would you like an opportunity to respond to uh, uh, his uh, points and around the engineering of the, the sign and it's, it's, it is a I mean, I, I, I certainly, I certainly agree with. Um, it's a, um, it's a, it's a large sign. We don't plan to to move it, so we don't have, you know, issues that would come from the wind approaching it from a different angle or, or something like that. Um, like with any aspect of um, of a renovation, we will be extremely uh, diligent about making sure that the structural integrity of the building you know is maintained throughout construction and that we monitor very closely to make sure there are no issues with the sign um, in terms of the uh, the, the um, first comment in the letter I think we have a slightly different view of, of what views are blocked and we work very hard to, to make sure that um, that we did, did not block most of the key view corridors that the BPDA had asked us to look at Okay, I just, in case people have an interest in that. And, you know. Okay, are there any further questions from the board? I'm just wondering, sorry, if Related Bill could kind of articulate its position about the Sitka sign. What, what is your position going forward in 5, 10, 15 years? And what, I what is your thinking around the sign now that you own this building? I mean, our, our position from, from the beginning has been that, um, that we are, are very focused on maintaining the sign and our, our development, you know, very much uh, incorporated the sign into our design and we, um, you know, had agreed to um, the, the basic terms of a very long-term lease with Sitco and I think we're hopeful that um, with, um, <coughs> you know, ultimately if this project is approved, I think we're hopeful that we will then be able to, you know, secure a long-term um, agreement with Sitco that will preserve the, the sign for many years. Great, thank you. I have a question. <coughs> The Commonwealth Building, how much higher could that have been and how many more jobs could have been created if we didn't have a stupid Sitco sign? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that question. It is, uh, it is very true that we, um, that we substantially um, reduced what we would have um, built for, for that, that reason, but I, I, I can't answer specifically to the question. I didn't think you could, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any <coughs> further questions? We're hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. So moved. Second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations. Okay, the last item on the agenda is item number 29, the director's update. And Brian, would you like to take a moment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and through you to the members. Uh, first, Mr. Chairman, I have some uh, sad news to share. Our colleague here at the BPDA, John O'Brien, passed away suddenly last week. Uh, John was known to his family as Jack. He served uh, this agency and the city of Boston for over 28 years, most recently as a senior project manager at the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. John was a mentor and a friend to all who knew him at this agency, and he'll be deeply missed by all of us. Our thoughts are with his wife, Amy, and his three children, Bridget, Aurora, and John, at this very sad time. Tonight, I'd also like to welcome three new board members to the Boston Civic Design Commission, the BCDC. Uh, I'd also like to welcome a new chair. First, for those in the audience and viewing tonight, the BCDC, the Civic Design Commission, is charged with examining the aesthetics of proposed development projects in Boston and ensuring that the projects have a positive impact on Boston's public realm. The BCDC provides a forum for the general public and professional design community to participate in the shaping of the city's physical form and natural environment. The BCDC holds public meetings on the first Tuesday of the month and subcommittee meetings on Tuesday evenings. The public is encouraged 
uh, to attend. But our three new members, first, Eric Howler, Nick Young Kim, and Anne Marie Lubino. Uh, Anne Marie, Nick Young, and Eric have been appointed to serve as commissioners, while Andrea Lears, who has served as a commissioner to the BCDC since 2007, has been appointed to serve as the new chair of the commission. Eric Howler is an architect, a designer, an educator, and founding principal of Howler and Yoon Architecture. He's currently an associate professor in architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He has a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University and a Master's of Architecture from Cornell University. Mick Young Kim is an international landscape architect and urban designer as well as the founding principal of Mick Young Kim Design. This year, her firm has been awarded the prestigious Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum National Design Award, and she's also the recipient of the American Society of Landscape Architects National Design Medal. Her life's work is featured in the Smithsonian Museum American Voices Collection. Anne-Marie Lubinow is director of the Rudy Brunner Award for Urban Excellence at the Brunner Foundation in Cambridge. In this capacity, she oversees a national design award program that recognizes transformative places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of cities. Anne-Marie is a registered architect and holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Carnegie Mellon. And from 2011 to 2012, she was a Harvard Loeb Fellow. Finally, Andrea Lears, again, has been on the commission since 2007. Now she's the chairman. Andrea is a principal and co-founder of Lears Weinzaffel Associates, a Boston-based practice focused on the intersection of architecture, urban design, and infrastructure. In December 2006, Andrea became the first woman owner of a practice to receive the American Institute of Architecture Firm Award, the organization's highest honor. Andrea holds an undergraduate degree in art history from Wellesley College and a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Fine Arts. As we head to the end of the year, I just want to sum up our numbers, where we stand uh, in the middle of November. With your actions tonight, you've approved 12 million square feet of new development in Boston. Of that 12 million square feet of development approved this year, 4,300 units of housing. 883 of those units are income restricted affordable. That's more than 20% of the total residential approvals this year. And finally, all of that activity, all of that development activity will yield in <coughs> construction jobs, other direct jobs that flow from the projects, and indirect jobs that flow from this economic acti activity will represent 20,000 plus jobs for the people of Boston and the metropolitan area. Again, uh, a very positive story as far as the square footage that's uh, being approved and the direct benefits it yields in the daily lives of the people of Boston. Finally, uh, just a quick word of farewell to somebody who actually doesn't work at this agency, never worked at this agency, never worked in City Hall as far as I know, but I think it's worth saying goodbye to him tonight in an official BPDA proceeding. Uh, Tom Glynn has served as the uh, CEO of the Massachusetts Port Authority at Massport for the past six years. Tom has been a terrific partner to this agency. Uh, for those who live and work in the, the realm of the BPDA, we know Massport has 600 acres 
of land it owns in the city of Boston. Very often, the development of that land bumps up against uh, some of the land that we own and certainly some of the private sector projects that are occurring in the city of Boston. And about five years ago, when I was appointed to this position, Tom and I began to meet with senior staffs on a monthly basis. So senior staff at Massport and senior staff at BPDA, utterly unprecedented, unprecedented, have been coming together monthly to work on issues of common concern, uh, issues that yield benefits uh, in, the, in the way of economic development uh, for the people of Boston. So he and his staff have been terrific partners for us to deal with over the past several years. We consider ourselves very fortunate to have had this relationship uh, during his tenure at Massport. Tom's last day as CEO of Massport is tomorrow. Uh, I just wanted to say on behalf of all of us uh, who work with him and his team, uh, farewell, good luck, and thanks very much uh, for the positive, constructive relationship that, that he helped establish between the two agencies. With that, uh, have a very good rest of the night. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. Are there any questions from, from the board? Pretty positive uh, report. Uh, the final item is a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn this meeting. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> meeting adjourned.